you've been so bold to say that you shoot for a target of 70 to 80 grams of fiber in a day. So did I get that right? And anything you want to add to that? Yeah, you, you got that exactly right. Um, so we do see a lot of fiber variation in, in um, subsistence populations. You know, on one end, you have the Chimane who are getting um, you know, sometimes up, upwards of 100 grams per day. Uh, they have a diet that's about 70% carbs. A lot of that is tubers. And so they're going to be getting a lot of fermentable fiber from that. On the other end of the spectrum, you know, you have people like uh, the Maasai, and they get very, very little um, fiber intake. And so they both have exceptional outcomes. But I think that if you look at uh, the differences between, you know, something like the, the Hadza or the Chimane, who get more fiber intake versus, you know, the Maasai that don't, you just see a little less cardiovascular disease in those who get a little bit more fiber and have lower saturated fat, um, lower, lower CAC, less fatty streaks. Um, but yeah, I think fiber is incredible. We have this tendency to think about, you know, fiber just kind of as roughage. And that is going to be the insoluble fiber, you know, typically where it doesn't go in, it doesn't ferment. Um, but the fermentable fiber, you know, what that's going to do is it's going to ferment it down into these short chain fatty acids. And that's, that's the important part. The important part is having enough of those. And if you have, uh, you know, enough short chain fatty acids, you're going to get uh, really good signaling uh, for HDAC inhibition. And so HDAC, one of the things that it controls is um, your tight junctions in your gut lining. And so if you inhibit HDAC, your junctions in your gut lining are going to be, become more tight. Uh, if you do not have a lot of fiber, it's going to go in the opposite direction and your gut junctions will start loosening. One of the reasons why I think that is, is because you're still going to need butyrate. And uh, what happens in settings of low fiber is the butyrate comes from a mucin from your gut lining that's then fermented uh, instead of uh, you're getting that from fiber. So HDAC inhibition is one. Another thing that it will do is it will signal um, what's called FFAR2 and FFAR3. And what those do indirectly is uh, they will stimulate the production of uh, endogenous GLP-1 to help with appetite control and then also PYY, uh, which is also for appetite control. So um, it can have uh, also have impacts on insulin sensitivity. So if we don't have a lot of fiber in our diet and we're primarily at that point in time, uh, your microbiome will switch over to fermenting mostly amino acids. Uh, when that happens, you can have uh, resulting things like it's called IMP. Um, so that can be something that's produced uh, that has been associated with atherosclerosis and then also insulin resistance. Um, you can get uh, byproducts like ammonia or another one called p crustal. So in a state of you know, adequate and higher, higher fiber, you're not going to see those toxic uh, metabolites. You're going to have HDAC inhibited so that your gut, your gut uh, junctions are tight. You're going to see more signaling on the GLP-1 and PYY side. And then also um, your immunity won't be as overactive. So when you kind of remove fiber, I think one of the reasons um, you know, why this may be the case is that it's kind of signaling to your body that there's not an abundance of food out there. And so it kind of needs to go into um, a period where it's preparing for, um, you know, just less food availability. Um, that's kind of my, my personal opinion. And when that happens, it needs to upregulate um, our immune systems. It's going to uh, kind of uh, upreg uh, upregulate insulin resistance because you don't know when you're going to get glucose next, increase our hunger. So that's kind of like why I think it's happening. Um, but I do believe it's meant to be kind of a temporary state, more to get us through like a winter where there's not as much plant material 
than the default state, which it is for most people. So walk us through, how do you get your 70 to 80 grams of fiber? Obviously we're talking about you. This is your out of yes. one experience, but based on all the literature you've seen out there and the different types of fibers you wanna uh, try to incorporate in your diet, uh, how are you getting that in typically? I think that you can do pretty well if you, you include two, two to three servings of vegetables uh, per day. Um, but then also looking to incorporate things, what's called like RS2 or RS3. So these are resistant starches. And what, what's great about them is they will you know, resist digestion. So they will make their way into your colon um, you know, undigested. And this is great because then um, your microbiome is able to ferment those into the short chain fatty acids. And so you can get resistant starches from things like uh, green bananas are really high in them, if you can tolerate them. Heated and cooled potatoes or rice is another good one. Um, so you, you heat them and then you cool them and they become uh, RS3 in that case. Or heated and cooled beans is another, another version of that. Um, so I think that if you can try to get um, at least a serving or two per those, of those per day, you'd be in pretty good shape. Um, there are also um, you know, things that you can do like potato starch, um, putting like a tablespoon of potato starch in your diet or green banana flour is another one that's really good. Um, so that can be great. However, um, you have a really big disclaimer here, and that is it's important to go you know, very, very slowly and really observe any symptoms that you're having. Um, because if, if you're not used to having you know, a lot of fiber in your diet, um, you know, your microbiome may not be ready for it. And so you could get uh, like some gas, some bloating. Um, so if you're noticing those, you probably want to back off a bit um, and just go a little slower. Yeah, that's great advice. You know, connecting those two things together with something that uh, I came across recently, which was an episode that... Uh, Andrew Huberman was doing on the insulin resistance subtypes. I think you tweeted about it as well too. Yeah. Um, you know, the background that I come from is I'm, I'm Indian. I was born in actually, I was born in Kenya. Uh, interestingly enough, one of the coolest trips that I went on was I went and stayed at this uh, camp in um, Northern Kenya where we were spending all this time over the course of a week with um, the Samburu, which are cousins of the Maasai. And uh, mm. getting a chance to see how they live, going on walks with them, seeing the area, uh, wow, you know, so cool. meeting their families. It was, it was one of the coolest uh, experiences that, uh, that I ever had, like fetching water with them. Uh, wow. Yeah, just like living you know, a day-to-day -day life with them. Uh, if anybody actually wants to check it out, this, the camp is really cool. I'll put the link in the show notes. But um, my background is Indian. And uh, in North America, Indians, the Indian subtype population, so South Asian, so Indian, Pakistani, uh, Bangladeshi, Sri Lankan, they have the highest cardiovascular risk of any mm. ethnic minority that's there. And, um, you know, cardiovascular disease, even in India, is a big, big problem. Um, not just, you know, the things that we typically deal with in the West, but, but there too, it seems that air pollution is a big driver of poor endothelial mm. health. I think of the top... 50 most polluted cities in the world. India has like 10 of them that are there. So it's a, it's a very unfortunate situation. Um, nonetheless, coming back to the South Asian population in the United States, from the time that I was young and always got blood work, I had always seen that, uh, you know, my lipids were, were uh, really, really off, that my LDL was high. We weren't really looking at ApoB back then. That's a more of a new phenomenon. And I noticed that my triglycerides uh, would always uh, jump up, even once I started watching my diet, but then I'd add in some extra uh, carbohydrates as I started training inside of the gym and my trainer would say, hey, let's, let's try to have you have like maybe 200, 250 grams of carbs as we're really sort of getting you in the zone of increasing muscle mass, re you know, replenishing glycogen. And I would get blood work after these periods of doing these N of one experiments, just like you're doing. And I would see my triglycerides had shot up all of a sudden. Shot up. Mm -hmm. And the more and more that I learned uh, through my cardiologist uh, is that it seems that a lot of people from this region have a combination of a few different genes that they're dealing with 
that make them more likely to be, in my instance, I'm a hyper reabsorber. So there's hyper producers that are out there that have familial hyper cholesterolemia. I'm in the category of being somebody that's a hyper reabsorber. So when I have, you know, uh, some of these uh, fats through my food, and if they're excessive, my body just tends to recirculate a lot of those lipids that are there. And that's why clearance is going to be, you know, so important for somebody, um, somebody like me. In addition to that, there was a few other uh, uh, genes that I had. Um, I did a test. I wrote about it in my newsletter. Uh, um, I can link to it in the show notes if people are curious about it. I, uh, where I also was somebody who, um, for whatever reason, triglycerides also hang around a lot longer in my, in my bloodstream as well, too. So I'm very sensitive to having a lot more carbohydrates uh, um, in my, in my diet, uh, as well. So now I sort of cycle on and off. I'll have it on, I'll have a mm-hmm. higher carbohydrate load on days that I train, and then I'll kind of bring it down to a more maintenance mode that was there. Uh, the point of the reason that I'm bringing this up, um, talking to a lot of different South Asians, uh, who are living here in the West. One of the things that they see is again, they tend to be programmers, they tend to be doctors, they tend to be these uh, high, uh, you know, Zoom professionals that are out there. What that lifestyle comes with being a lot um, more sedentary, you're not moving as much. And then on top of that, when you audit the traditional sort of Indian and then American diet that they're that they're having, they're not really having a lot of fiber in their diet as well, too. So it's definitely feels to me that it's one of the reasons that this group of individuals is having such a hard time with lipid clearance and having such poor uh, blood results that are increasing their cardiovascular risk. Uh, so that was a little, you know, just me sharing some context for my audience because I've talked about this before and the journey that I've been on, which is increasing my fiber and uh, making sure I get activity. And then in my instance, because I am a hyper reabsorber, I chose to go on uh, azetamide uh, after looking at a lot of the different data and working with my cardiologist. Again, not medical advice and I'm not a doctor. Um, But the combination of those three things that I did made a significant difference in my uh, blood work. And also, I just felt better as well, too. So I'd love you to also make the connection of what what do you know about, in, in addition to being fiber being great for gut health and protecting that uh, mucus lining and making sure that our body doesn't eat our own mucus lining because there's not enough fiber and short chain fatty acids that we're providing it with. What what do you know about fiber and cardiovascular disease? That's another thing that it can help with. It's just cholesterol clearance. Um, So uh, certain types of fiber can really help uh, uh, clear, clear cholesterol. Um, so that, that could be one thing. Um, going back, I do think genetics are so important. And it's so great that you found the genes that you have because uh, I have some, some clearance genes myself, um, actually very similar. But if, if you're able to find these and kind of find the genetic reason why, uh, it can be a r- real game changer in being able to change your own health. Uh, to understand what those are and to be able to modify your lifestyle around them. One other thing that I think uh, could could also be really interesting to think about too is I think the uh, the South Asian diet sometimes can be a little lower in choline. Mm. Choline is one of the most important things that we can have uh, for cholesterol, and the reason why is it is used as a structural element. Um, acetyl, uh, so phosphatidylcholine in packaging VLDL. And so if you do not have uh, choline, your VLDL is going to be exported with uh, very triglyceride rich. And then ultimately this will uh, result in more what's called SDLDL or small dense LDL, which is very atherogenic. So yeah, it just made me wonder, uh, you know, could that also be a, one of the problems could be possibly low choline as well. Yeah, that's a great insight. Um, 
I'm, I'm going to share just really quickly because it's uh, it could be interesting for our audience here. I, I wrote about it before, and then I want to hear about how you've gone through the, the journey as well, too. So YouTube, if you enjoyed what you just saw, keep watching for more great content on how to improve your brain and your life. It, it can be very difficult to get, you know, even 10,000 steps can seem like a really big challenge. Uh, but I think it's a lot more manageable if you just think about like how to break it up.